Okay, uh, hello again, uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, so um, today I'll be talking about building things and in particular building non-trivial things and actually why there are so many graveyards of that projects. Um, so, but yeah, before we'll start for real, let's play a game. Uh, it's a drinking game, of course, and it's called Never Have I Ever. Uh, so the rules are simple. I say something that I think you uh, you did and may be a bit ashamed to admit. And you raise your hands, because uh, we cannot drink here, uh, if you really did that. Um, so here goes the first one. Never have I ever wrote my own CMS, because I thought I can do that better than everyone else. And I know there are some Neos developers here, so you should raise your hands. <laughs> Okay, uh, here goes another one. Um, never have I ever rewrote a library XYZ because it was so buggy, so slow, or whatever reason. Okay, yeah, again. And one more, never have I ever rewrote a library because it missed that one feature and was too lazy to learn the existing ones to add it. Yeah, okay. Again, exactly. So uh, most of us, at least, were there at least once in our careers. So uh, actually, I tried to check my GitHub profile for all the abandoned projects that I created in the past, but uh, it turns out that I was so ashamed of them that I deleted all those repositories. Um, so instead, I will uh, tell you a story from CK Source, the company I work for. Uh, we are the creators of CK8 or FCK8 or CK8 or 345 and so on. And we also have a couple other JavaScript projects. So basically, we do a lot of uh, big scale JavaScript. And uh, five years ago, we wanted to improve uh, Test Runner for uh, CK8 or 4. Um, so we had this list of requirements, and uh, we, di we did a research, of course, and we checked. We we checked that the existing solutions, they met most of those requirements, but, uh, but two. Uh, and we, of course, checked that we couldn't add them easily to the existing test runners. Uh, so there, was, there were some gaps that we couldn't easily fix. Um, so we thought, OK, this is our chance. Let's build a new test runner for JavaScript community. It will be extensible, it will be powerful, and so on and so on. Uh, so we called it Bender.js, uh, and about one year later, we had it ready. Uh, we ported CK84 test to, to Bender, and we're really happy. It really worked well, and our lives got so much better. Uh, but then, yeah, the project died. The project died one year after we started it, and you can, as you perhaps can see, uh, we stopped at version 0 0.4. And it's not very popular either. Um, so yeah, what went wrong? Um, so uh, first of all, we under underestimated the, the cost of the maintenance of it. So of course, we knew that it won't be a one-time effort to build it and just forget it. We knew that we'll have to maintain it. However, we didn't like account for uh, the fast-progressing JavaScript ecosystem and the time that we need to add new features to it. So for instance, Cicator 4 is stuck right now, uh, and we cannot have a nice CI for it or browser stack integration because we don't have features for that, and investing in that would be really costly. Um, and the second reason was that we assumed, or at least hoped, um, that a nice project like that, uh, if it you know, fits the market, solves real-world issues, and so on, it will attract uh, developers like flies. And it didn't happen because we didn't promote it and uh, we actually left it in our graveyard. Um, so yeah, we like spent 300 man days on this project. Uh, and you can imagine now how much we could actually achieve if we contributed back to, for instance, Karma. We could even you know, rewrite big parts, work with the community, and promote our brand. But instead, we wasted those 300 man days. So disaster. So let's create a WYSIWYG editor. And uh, before we'll actually start, a quick side note, I will often say rich text editor. I think it's a more, more fitting word. It's a more narrow word. So WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get. Um, uh, but this can be like a page builder, presentation builder, and whatever. So rich text fits, uh, fits it more. Um, so yeah, let's create a rich text editor. And you may be thinking now that this is a pretty complicated task. I have no idea how to start that. But we are developers, so let's Google it. 
Uh, so this is how to create a WYSIWYG editor, and there is a tutorial, 13 minutes long, and at the end of this tutorial, we have a working WYSIWYG editor. Uh, then we have another result, another tutorial, 5 to 10 minutes read, and you again have a working editor. And the, the second page looks good as well. So we'll, you will learn from those articles that you have to use to, two things. First, is the attribute content editable true, which makes an element editable, and then you can use document.exec command to, for instance, apply bold uh, to the selection or change a paragraph into a heading. Um, so yeah, let's see a demo of using it on uh, neoscon.io. So first, I will add content editable to the body element. And I can now edit the website. I can put the carrot wherever I want. I can add the missing Fs, because it should be neosconf, of course. Um, I can merge some paragraphs. Um, then I can use document.exec command to make some text italic. And I can even use the native uh, emoji picker. Really cool. Um, so we can now add a couple of buttons at the top, at the top, bold, italic, heading, and so on. Use document.exec command, and we can publish our project on GitHub. Then we can, of course, well, this is dark. Uh, then we can, of course, uh, publish it to Product Hunt as well, Hacker News, Reddit, and so on, because we created the most, the lightest and most flexible WYSIWYG editor out there, and it really happened. Um, but then the bugs report come. And here goes the first one. So we have this plain content editable, and there's output below. Uh, there is a heading with two paragraphs, and I'm pressing backspace to merge them. And some inline styles appear. And then even more. That's not good. We don't want this in our database. Um, another one, let's copy some content from any website to our editor. Ooh, and this is even more inline styles and actually some SVGs, and I have no idea what else. You don't want this in your database. Um, and this is actually my favorite. So we have uh, this word bar wrapped with EM and strong, and I'll be deleting it and typing again. So I'm deleting it and typing. And what do I have? B and I elements. Of course, this is not like a super big issue, but people really report that to us. Uh, and this is actually an editor that has like 10,000 stars on GitHub. And let's play a bit with it. So we are applying italic, paragraph, and heading. And this HTML is really not a valid HTML. This is awful. So yeah, but you're not a beginner developer. You have Stack Overflow, so you can patch all those things. Uh, so the plan is simple. Uh, we have, so we want to fix, for instance, the behavior of the backspace key. So we listen to a key down. Uh, we check the key code, uh, we get the selection, get the range out of the selection, and do some magic. So for instance, we merge some blocks, and then we set the selection back. Uh, not really. Um, so let's see on some, uh, some examples. So here is a bolded word foo and italicized word bar, and there's a caret between those two words. In how many positions in the DOM can this single caret end up? In five. So it can be in the text node foo, in the text node bar, in strong, and in, and in the i element, and in the uh, paragraph. So you have to account in your code for all those situations. Um, then we have a lovely example from even better article, uh, why content editable is terrible, and there is this sentence with the word buggings at the end. It's bold, uh, bolded and italicized. In how many ways in the DOM can this single word be represented? Turns out that. I think it's infinite, because uh, if you consider empty inline elements, then you can have like, yeah, however you, how, uh, as many of them as uh, you can imagine. Um, and one last example. So let's say you are trying to fix the uh, behavior of control B, so applying bold to, to a text. So you have this empty, uh, empty selection. You press control B, and the expected behavior is that when the user st starts typing now, the, the inserted text will appear bold. So yeah, the user presses Control B. You create a strong element, put the selection there, and you expect now that, that the browser will start inserting the characters there. It turns out it won't, because the browser decides that the better selection position is before this strong element, and those characters will appear there for no good reason. Um, so yeah, it's awful. Um, 
but you are a toughy and you have a lot of time, like two years or something. So you uh, you made it. Uh, you fixed the most annoying bugs, and uh, this is your this is your editor. It's a content editable DOM uh, with pile of listeners. You listen to events, do some changes to the DOM, and that's it. It's simple. And this way you join the classical editor club because this is how most, I mean, all of the classical editors from the past were created. We started with content editable and started adding uh, fixes on top of that. And uh, of course, we made some wrappers, polyfills, and whatever for missing features or bugs, but in the end, it's still the same uh, architecture. And this architecture isn't like specific for rich text editors. It's, what, it's how the web looked like 10 years ago. So we were focus on, focusing on dealing uh, with bugs, with inconsistencies, rather than architecturing our applications. And of course, like jQuery or Motools or Prototype uh, were brilliant pieces of engineering, but it was actually sad that we had to deal with those bugs and like creating two column layouts instead of architecturing our applications. F uh, fortunately, uh, like 10 years ago, uh, a race began. A race towards a better web with standards, with no bugs, and eventually with no Internet Explorer. And um, finally, as JavaScript developers, we could uh, start you know, talking about design patterns, about uh, programming paradigms, and we started creating frameworks. And actually, we started creating a lot of them. So this is days since the last JavaScript framework, and I've never seen anything more than uh, zero here, so every day there is a new JavaScript framework. Um, this is also day since the last JavaScript framework, and it says none, so not a number. And there's even an Alexa app for that. Uh, so yeah, you can ask your Alexa. Um, but yeah, so people started tinkering and you know doing uh, crazy things with, uh, with JavaScript, so they started thinking, can we improve rich text editors as well? Um, so since they quickly would learn that content editable is terrible, they would try to get rid of it and try to build an editor without a content editable. Um, and um, yeah, let's see how it goes. So first of all, you need to handle typing. Uh, so we listen to Keynote again. You prevent default these events, so you say to the browser that I will handle this change, don't change the DOM. And then you translate the key code to a character and insert this character into, uh, into your editor. Simple. But then, in some languages like Polish, to type as, uh, a character, we have to press two keys. And this is becoming tricky, because you don't know the uh, keyboard layout that the user has. And even if you knew it, then you'd have to implement all the mappings for all the keys and all the keyboard layouts. And this is getting tricky. Uh, fortunately, there is uh, like a newer property called event.key, uh, so you can actually improve your code. Uh, it, it gets shorter. You use this property because it gives you the right letter. But then, let's handle Spanish. And to, uh, to type accented, accented letters in Spanish, you first press the accent character, and then you press the actual letter. Uh, you can actually also see that there is this underline below uh, the, the accent. And this is OS specific. So if you would like to be like, um, mm, you know, consistent with the operating system, you would have to you know, implement it differently for different operating systems. And this is again, getting a bit more tricky. But then there is typing of Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and so on, which uses so-called input method engine. And this is actually, I'm typing random stuff here. I don't know what I'm doing. And you can see this pop up and you know, choosing the right combination of the right characters. And this is called composition. And you would never, never want to implement this in JavaScript, especially that it's well integrated with operating systems and you know, like past things that you wrote. Um, so yeah, um, and this is actually only the beginning because uh, there are more things that you would have to re-implement if you dropped content editable. There's accessibility, spell checking, auto completion, clipboard access, grammar checking, uh, and so on. And even the current navigation, if you consider all the input methods like keyboard, mouse, and touch devices, and I don't know your TV, whatever, then it's becoming super complex. So you cannot really drop content editable these days. It's still your friend, and instead of trying to kill it, let's try to you know, tame it and see what we can do. So uh, what we learned so far is that the DOM is really bad at representing rich text, and the selection there is really tricky to, to work with. Um, so yeah, what if we created an, like an abstract presentation of this rich text and work with that? 
Um, so, yeah, this abstract structure can be designed specifically to represent rich text, and then it will be easier to work with it. So I'll be, I'll be talking about CK8 or 5 now and how we did it in CK8 or 5. So we have this abstract data model, which is a tree structure like the DOM, uh, but it's a bit different. Uh, there is, uh, instead of like in nice styles like bold, italic, represented by strong and EM elements, we have text uh, nodes attributes, uh, which like in lines makes the, the, the list flat, so it's easier to work with. Uh, then we have the view, uh, which is another abstract structure, uh, but uh, it's more close to the DOM than, the, than to the model. So, for instance, there is strong element to represent uh, the bold and uh, normal naming for the elements. And then finally, we have uh, this uh, DOM uh, that's automatically generated by CK8 or 5. And, uh, at this stage, CK8 or 5 gets, uh, like, takes care of uh, uh, adding uh, BRs to empty block elements so they have no zero height or rendering subsequent spaces as a combination of normal spaces and non-breaking spaces. And uh, this is the data flow, so the user interacts with the DOM, we change the model, the model gets converted to the view, and the view gets rendered to the DOM. Um, and that's it about it. Um, so for a moment, let's get back to uh, the classical editor. So if you would try to implement features for the classical, uh, approach, um, then your plugins have to work with the DOM. Of course, there, there can be some wrapper, um, the DOM, or some helpers to work with it, but your plugins have to like, consider it. Um, this is, again, CK8 or 5, and it's model view and editable DOM, and your plugins reside here. So they don't have to like, care about the DOM. They work between the model and the view, and everything is like work with structures, uh, that are designed to really be easier to work with uh, if you consider rich text. Um, and uh, Cicator 5 is not uh, alone here. Uh, in the like couple of years, uh, new editors were created. And they have a bit different data models. Some of them are based on React, some not. Uh, one of them has, I mean, Quill has linear data models, so it's a, it's a simpler data model. And they have, of course, different capabilities, but they all have this abstract data model. Um, but you may notice that between the classical editor club and the modern editor club, there's only one common thing, and it's Cicator. But this, these are actually two different versions of Cicator. Uh, and why uh, is it like that? It's because you cannot easily move from the classical editor club to the modern editor club. It means rewriting your software from scratch. And uh, it's actually what we had to do, and it took us like three years to get to 1.0, and then I'm not even talking about uh, feature uh, parity with the previous version, so it's a huge, in huge investment. And um, yeah, but it opens uh, many new possibilities. And for us, it meant that we can implement real-time collaborative editing, so like a holy grail of rich text editor developers, uh, that uh, we could implement suggestion modes like in Google Docs, and uh, also that you know implementing plugins got so much easier that also those plugins, even those implemented by the community, get more stable. Um, so yeah, are we done here? And. For plugin developers, I think yes, because as plugin developers, you have a very nice uh, picture right now. Um, but for us, not really. Uh, because we managed to hide the complexity, but we didn't get rid of it. The complexity is still there. And it's actually right here on this, on this diagram. It's on the, in the rendering and the DOM events. Um, so let's talk about the DOM events first. So those are the kind of some kinds of interactions that the user can have with the editor. And the problem with the DOM today is that it doesn't actually have uh, that many events that we would need and APIs to you know, control that. Uh, so we, we are often guessing what the user did. So for instance, when the user types, we actually diff the old uh, structure with the old text with the new text and like learn what character was inserted there. And this is really tricky if you consider spell checking, for instance. Um, so we started thinking in W3C what we could do with it, how we could improve it. Um, and um, yeah, we designed this before input event. Uh, it's, it's meant to contain like more semantical information about what the user did, so we, can, we don't have to guess anymore. 
uh, and uh, it would, the life would be so much easier with it. Um, but then we get to the rendering part. And who's responsible for, for rendering? It's the editor. So who shouldn't touch the DOM? The browser shouldn't touch the DOM. So for this event to be really like uh, useful for us, uh, it would have to be preventable. So we should be able to tell that the browser shouldn't actually change, uh, change the DOM. But it turns out that this isn't really possible today. Uh, because the assumption here would be that uh, that the browser actually controls the editing, while this is not true, because who really controls the editing is the OS, I mean the operating system, and the IME. The IME is like an application built, built on top of an uh, operating system, and it's, it's actually talking to the browser like, please delete all those characters that are currently selected and insert this one character or a couple of characters. Um, and the browser has to do that. So, uh, and the even bigger problem is that uh, on certain devices, for instance, on Android, every single keyboard is implemented as an IME. So for instance, that's why on uh, Android, you don't have key codes. So when you, the user presses some button on the virtual keyboard, on the software keyboard, uh, in JavaScript, you cannot learn that this was a letter A or um, doesn't have a key code uh, or that this was enter because the browser only learns that you should insert a paragraph, a new paragraph, not that this was an enter key. Um, so yeah, the, all the, the entire inter, um, interaction model between the, the browser and, uh, and JavaScript here is really flawed, and we uh, are thinking how we could actually change it, uh, but it's really tricky. It turns out that this is really tricky, uh, and uh, not much will change in the near future, so unfortunately this is how this picture will look for, I don't know, next 10 years. Uh, frankly speaking, because we started talking with uh, W3C in 2015, and actually we don't even have this before input event ready, so it's really taking a lot of time. Mm. So yeah, uh, it's it's still complicated. So there is this famous quote. It's supposedly by uh, Einstein, but I think that was some random guy on the internet. Everyone knew it was impossible until a fool who didn't know that came along and did it. And uh, perhaps, I mean, as developers, we love ch challenges. We love tinkering with things. We, we love building new things. Uh, but perhaps it's uh, specific to JavaScript community, but we got a bit crazy and careless. Uh, a typical JavaScript newsletter these days is like, oh, a new bundler X was just released, or a new library foo was released and is faster than anything else. And most of those projects are then dead within months. Um, of course, perhaps many of them were innovative and we could learn from that, but I would really like wish myself that uh, we put more effort into actually contributing to existing projects in JavaScript and uh, you know, working with them. And of course, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not trying to like discourage you from uh, creating new things, working on new things, testing new things. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have many really cool projects like Neos. Um, but whenever you feel like rewriting that thing from scratch because you don't like it, please be responsible because there may be more to that than meets the eye. Thank you.